So you're going to have to put up with me preaching through a mask this morning. But uh, yeah, we wanted to spend some time this summer talking about friendship and its importance to us. Um, it's, I think, an important topic, especially as we, well, I was going to say come out of COVID. Some of us are still wearing a mask. But, you know, friendship is one of those things that maybe we've let moss kind of grow on over the last couple of years. Maybe we haven't uh, engaged in friendship in the way that uh, we would like to. And sometimes life just keeps us from doing that. As the song kind of talked about, you know, we, it's, we don't, I think it's in your younger years, you don't realize how difficult actually it can be to make friends. You know, when you're a kid, it just seems to happen organically with, with very little effort. And yet friendship is one of those things that's really critical to life. Um, and I think especially as Christians, we ought to maybe have a leg up in, in being good friends, in having meaningful friendships. And I think as we examine what the Bible has to say about it, we'll, we'll see that there's an important role for friendship in our lives, in, in the life that, that God has laid out for us, maybe in a way that, that we didn't know about previously. I think especially in our North American culture, it's something for us to think a bit about. We, we prize certain relationships, like they're really important to us. And in whatever culture you go into, certain relationships are held above others. Uh, in, in the time of the Old Testament, we're going to be going back to Proverbs chapter 27 this morning, if you've got your Bible. And in the time of the Old Testament and, and in that culture, family relationships by far were the most important. That was kind of like the top tier. Um, in our culture, it's a little different. I think you see romantic relationships as being the most important. You know, how many online dating companies are there out there? How many online dating apps even are there for romantic relationships? But, you know, when you think about friendships, about making new friends, how many apps are there for that? I mean, there's lots, you know, that appeal to nostalgia, you know, uh, looking at our old friends, and that song, you know, is kind of like the quintessential nostalgic song about going back to old friends. But how many, you know, apps are out there, are out there just for making a new friendship? You know, there, there might be some that kind of do that sort in a sort of indirect manner, but I, I, I think there's a far fewer number where that's the direct idea. So I think in our culture, we really value romantic relationships, but but friendships maybe are a little more on the back burner. And this, this was brought home for me, actually, as I was thinking about this this week. I think I can encapsulate that in two phone calls that I made in the space of an hour when I was about, I think I must have been about 20 or 21. And so I was working at a Bible camp, and we had no landline on the premises. And this was before cell phones were ubiquitous, and I had one. So, so on my day off, I would go, okay, well, this should this should date it for me, actually. I should be able to place the date. So it would have been, yeah, it was 2000, summer of 2001. I would walk off camp, and about a mile down the road, there was an old defunct highway diner, but it still had a payphone. And I, so I'd go to the payphone, and I'd call my girlfriend, who is now sitting at the back with my four children, and, uh, and we would chat. I, I would make her endure like a half hour phone conversation because she really didn't like the phone, but I, I'd give her a call. Well, one, one day I walked all the way out there, called, and she wasn't home. And I always called the same time, same day, every week. And so I was like, well, okay, this has never happened before. So I had a quick chat, I think, with one of her folks and hung up the phone and then thought, I walked all this way. Who else can I, what other person on the planet could I make a phone call to? And, and I did the quick mental Rolodex that this guy had. It was like, whose phone number do I have floating around in my head that I could call? And so my best friend from high school, I still can remember his phone number just off the top of my head. But I knew he wasn't home either. But I called him because his dad was the pastor, and we started talking about pastoral things, and, and that kind of worked out that way. But it, it was just, to me, it was kind of like, yeah, I have to, sort of that gut level check too of like, okay, here, my first impulse is to call my girlfriend, but then after that, it's like, who else's phone number do I actually even know? And there's only one, one name that kind of came to the top of the list. But I was glad for that friendship and still am. But as we get into the Bible, I think, too, it's interesting to look at the, what the Bible has to say about friendship for itself. Like, it's, 
Because I think it's one thing to come to the Bible and say, okay, let's let's try and find all the tips here and and turn the Bible into a manual for what it means to be a friend, to have friendships, and what friendships looks like. And we're going to do a bit of that because obviously we have our own concerns that we bring to Scripture. But I also want to let Scripture speak for itself and say, what's what's important about friendship to God's Word or in God's Word? What themes emerge when, rather than us going and trying to force it out of the Bible, what emerge when we just sort of listen and say, God, what do you have to say about friendship? God, what's important to you about friendship? And so we're going to see, over the next few weeks, some themes start to emerge. And, and so the next few weeks, we're going to kind of talk about the topic of friendship, and then through the summer, we're going to look through, uh, through July and August, we're going to look through specific fr- friendships that are in the Bible. There's lots of them. And so we're going to look at a few of them. But as we do that, we'll see specific themes emerge. Loyalty is a huge one in Scripture. The loyalty that exists between friends. Uh, influence. How we influence one another as friends. How do we call each other to be the best version of yourself as friends? And, and what's unique about the friendship relationship. And then two, we're going to look at specific friendship relationships because they're not all the same. Obviously, when I talk about being friends with my dog, I, that's a little different than you know my, being friends with you know a pal in high school or my wife or my parents. So there's some, some different um, issues that come up depending on who we're friends with. And ultimately, of course, we're going to talk about being friends with God. But to get us started this morning and just sort of introduce the topic and maybe just lay down some some basic foundational layers, I want us to go to Proverbs chapter 27. So that's in the Old Testament part of your Bible, if you're looking there. It's in the first half. And we're not going to read the um, the whole chapter. Proverbs kind of jumps around topically. And, and kind of gives you a snippet on this and a snippet on that, and then it might come back to an issue. But Proverbs chapter 27 does sp- speak quite a bit to friendship. There's a few different things that it deals with there. And so uh, Proverbs chapter 27, we're going to look at verses 5 to 10, and then 14 to 22. And so let's, let's uh, pick it up there. So most of these relate to friendship. There's a few that are, you know, maybe a little tangential tangential, but uh, I think it'll speak well to what we're looking at. Proverbs 27 verse 5 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. One who is full loathes honey from the comb, but to the hungry even what is bitter tastes sweet. Like a bird that flees its nest is anyone who flees from home. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. Do not forsake your friend or your, a friend of your family, and do not go to your relative's house when disaster strikes you. Better a near, ne- neighbor nearby than a relative far away. Then skipping down to verse 14. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. A quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. The one who guards a fig tree will eat its fruit, and whoever protects their master will be honored. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. Death and destruction are never satisfied, and neither are human eyes. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but people are tested by their praise. Though you grind a fool in a mortar, and grinding them like grain with a pestle, you will not remove their falling from them. So there's four sort of character qualities I wanted to focus on in terms of what, what makes up a good friendship. What does... The, the writer of Proverbs considered to be wise and, and, and the right way of living in friendship. And so four qualities are, uh, first, sincerity. 
then caring, then being there for one another, and fourth, uh, bringing out the best in one another. So sincerity, verses 5 and 6, he says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love, and wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You know, sometimes it's the role of our friends to tell us the truth. You know, how many of us uh, see political figures surrounded by people who only just tell them what they want to hear, and we realize the folly of that, the foolishness of it. That if you have people that will never actually contradict you, that will never actually just stop you and say, no, I think you're making a mistake, then you are the poorer for it. And so we need friends, we need to be friends that are sincere. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You know, um, several years ago, Tabitha and I were uh, at our last church, and we were going through a difficult time uh, with different things happening in the church, and Tabitha said something that stuck with me. She said, she was frustrated with me, and she said, I just wish that your opinion, your opinion on whatever we were talking about wouldn't change every time you talk to somebody. With, with the idea, it was like, uh, you know, whatever I thought on the issue happened to be the last person that I talked to. And it kind of it kind of stuck, because it, it cut deep. It, it was pretty accurate at the time, actually. And I realized, yeah, I need, to, I need to step back from this. But I think if somebody else had said it, you know, I don't know how well I would have, I would have taken that, but because I knew she cared for me, and I knew she was telling me the truth. And so, so that's, that sense of sincerity is important. It, it, it's vital even, you know, that it's like even in painful situations, actually maybe especially in painful situations, our friends ought to be the ones that can tell us the truth. I, I like how Paul encapsulates that in Roman, or sorry, in, in the book of Ephesians, saying that we need to, as Christians, be speaking the truth in love to one another. One other proverb that comes to mind when I, I think of that uh, is uh, Proverbs 17:17. 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. You know, it's often it's often the difficult times in life where we find out who our real friends are. Uh, you know, I have a friend in Saskatchewan, um, really struggling just with sort of deconstructing some of uh, his church life. And one of the things that's been really difficult for him is in a time that he kind of had to pull himself back from the church, you know, nobody came. Nobody knocked on his door except for one couple. And he said, yeah, now you kind of know who your real friends were and who was just kind of being polite Sunday morning, right? And so uh, a friendship has to be sincere, but it also has to be caring. Uh, verse 9, perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. Another way of translating uh, that phrase, heartfelt advice, might be advice that comes from the soul. You know, that comes from deep within. You know, a lot of us would read that and maybe think, the last thing I want from my friends is a bunch of unsolicited advice. <laughs> That's, you know, often the last thing that a lot of us are looking for, especially when we're really going through a hard time. But... But what I think the author of Proverbs is getting at is this isn't just somebody, you know, a friend isn't somebody who's just flipping out, you know, truisms and, and uh, pat answers. It's somebody that's actually sharing from deep within. They're saying, I care about you. And this is what I genuinely think. Not because I'm trying to solve the situation for you, but I just want what's best for you. And so the, the writer of Proverbs says, the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. They have to really pay attention, not, at, not in a flippant way, but actually sit down and listen to you. And we have to listen to our friends as well, right? So that's, that's another bit of wisdom on friendship from the writer of Proverbs. And then in what I think is very interesting language, he says, we have to, as friends, we have to be there for one another. Verses 8 and 10. Like a bird that flees its nest is anyone that flees from home. And then he carries on and expands the idea in verse 10. He says, Do not forsake your friend or a friend of your family, and do not go to your relative's house when disaster strikes you. Better a neighbor nearby 
than a relative far away. Now, I was kind of thinking through this. I, you know, I had an extra week to think through the sermon a bit, and it's like this is, I think, a very ought to be a very striking image for us. For us, it's like, yeah, a, a, a family member passes away, the family gathers, right? And yet, that's precisely the opposite of what the writer of Proverbs is saying. And he's saying it to a culture that is much more entrenched in family than we are. You know, it was like um, they value, as I said at the beginning, they value family on a much higher level than we do in our, our North American culture. So this is a very strong statement. But I think on some level we all kind of get it. It's like, yeah, I know my family, you know, in a time of adversity, my family will always be there. Not everybody can say that, unfortunately, but, but in good families, it's like, yeah, you know, in the hard times, they're there. But they may not be the people that you want to go play floor hockey with either, right? And I think that's what the writer of Proverbs is saying. It's like, we have an affinity with our family based on, on our familial relationship, but sometimes that only goes so far. And sometimes it's actually better to be with a friend who actually understands you than with family who loves you but maybe doesn't get you. And so there's a sort of a uniqueness to this friendship relationship that the author of Proverbs is pointing out. That, that it's a good thing to cultivate relationships because sometimes just family isn't enough. Sometimes a friend will get you in ways that family won't. And so he says, better a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. Another verse that comes to mind uh, from Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So he's already, I think the author of uh, Pro Proverbs is, is kind of pointing out this fact that it's like, yeah, actually there are some friendships that in some way will cut deeper, will last longer, will be truer than even the relationships that develop among family members. It doesn't always happen. It's not the rule, certainly, but, but he's holding out there's that possibility there, and we should look for that in life. And we should look for friendships that bring out the best in each other as well. A well-known verse from Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Now, I wanted to read through from 14, uh, because I think 14 kind of adds to this, but sandwiched in there is, you know, a, a, uh, a couple verses that we often roll our eyes at, especially um, if we've uh, been in the situation of being a wife. But verse 14 says, if anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it'll be taken as a curse. So we want to bring out the best in each other, as iron sharpens iron, but we have to do it at the right time, I think is what the author of Proverbs is saying, that there's a time and place for that. We can't always just go out and develop a friendship in the way that we would like to, but, you know, at, at any given point in the day. He says, you know, you get up early, even if you bless your neighbor, they will curse you. But then, but then it sandwiched in the middle of there is a quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining <coughs> her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with a hand, which, you know, we all kind of roll our eyes at when we hear that. It's not a uh, very, um, what, politically correct, very positive picture of um, married life there. But I think what, what, why it's there is to point out again that it's like, yeah, even, there's even a time where the marriage relationship is not is it's not the relationship that sort of pure that trumps all relationships. Sometimes you need a friendship in there as well. But there's a time and place for developing even that. And I can say that quite um, confidently because it's it's affirmed not just in scripture but by none other than the modern sage Red Green. So. <laughs> So one of his shows, he, you know, they'll have writer uh, people write in, and so um, a, a guy writes in and, and is complaining about uh, his relationship with his wife and just saying, oh, you know, it's like she wants to do this and that, and, and it's dragging me all over the place. And, and Red offers some advice that I thought was very timely. He says, I hear all of your complaints about, about your marriage, and he says, I think what you need is a girlfriend. No, not for you, idiot, for her. 
<laughs> so, so you, yeah, you don't want to go shopping at the mall. Yeah, you don't want to go see the girl, the girl movie at the theater. She needs a girlfriend. And, and I think there's a role for that even for all of us, you know, married people and unmarried alike. It's like, yeah, there is that role for a romantic relationship, but we also want to highlight that that does, doesn't meet every need. That doesn't fulfill every aspect of, our, of us relationship, r relationally. Sometimes we just need a friend. Sometimes we need something outside of that context. We need a friend that will bring out the best in us. You know, I think one of the unique things about friendship is the way it's self-selective, obviously. You know, you can't, you can choose your friends to some degree, but you can't choose your family. And I think even with family, it's always our intention that we're going to call out the best in each other. But how many of us have been at family gather gatherings and the opposite has happened? Am I right? Yeah, we've all, we've all been there. Um, that's certainly our intention with our family, but it's not always the result. And so friendship, in some ways, I think, gives us an opportunity to say, yeah, let's call out the best in each other. And, and because we're kind of selecting our company in a way, there, there's a way for us to maybe do that in a more uh, successful manner. But you might be wondering, like, friendship seems like kind of a meandering thread through scripture. And maybe even it seems like a, an odd thing to be bringing up for a, a several Sundays over, over the course of this summer. I think at the bottom of it for me, was the realization is like actually I think what what we talk about when we talk about valuing friendship is also the realization that loneliness is a big deal for a lot of us. Loneliness, even even in our North American culture, is everywhere. You know, despite the fact that we're we're more connected than we ever have been through internet and social media and in, instant messaging, that in some way those those things don't fill that relational need. You know, it's, it's great to be connected with, you know, whoever, uh, high school classmates, old friends from your old zip code, as Ben Rector puts it. But we need real, healthy friendships, because all of that can still feel, leave us feeling very alone. And as we're going to get into in the next couple of weeks, we're going to see that, that that begins, I think, this concept of friendship begins by being friends with God and getting to know Jesus Christ, getting to know somebody not just who can fill the void, but also getting to know somebody who has experienced loneliness as well. You know, we see that in the life of Christ. Um, you know, so, and some tr translations put it that, that Jesus will, at uh, times of stress and busyness, he will withdraw to a deserted place. But then also other translations say that he goes and he looks for a lonely place to be in. And, and as you read the, the Gospels, you do kind of get that um, feel that there is sort of a loneliness, sort of a, an emptiness in, in Jesus' life at, at certain periods. You know, while he's surrounded by crowds and disciples, and even family at different times, there is a, there is a, a certainty that he's experienced loneliness just as we experience it in our lives. And so developing friendship with God is not just to sort of fill the space, but also to share with him and to, to, to experience that and to know that loneliness together. But he doesn't leave us there. He invites us into friendship with himself. He invites us not just into friendship, but fellowship as well. That as God's people together, we get to develop meaningful relationships that are hopefully more than just church friends, but real, honest-to-goodness friendships as well. He invites us into a fellowship where we are welcome and welcomed, and, and people see us and are, are, are glad just for the sight of us. I think that's, uh, to me, one of the most uh, powerful stories that you're going to find sort of laying around our, our North American culture, and of course it does come from sort of a Christian wellspring, would be uh, the Lord of the Rings series. As much as it's a story about war and journeying and traveling and adventure, it's really, I think, a story about friendship as well. And, 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 and you've got that right in the title, The Fellowship of the Ring. That there's something that draws these people together 
And, and as you read it, you realize, yeah, friendships are emerging. And it's a beautiful thing when that happens. So to leave off this morning, I wanted um, to do something a little different uh, this summer as well. It was suggested to me that, you know, this would be a great opportunity just for us to share a little bit about our friendships and what they've meant to us. And so uh, Mark has volunteered uh, this morning to come and share a little bit about a, a Christian friendship that he had that, that's been meaningful to him over the years. So Mark. Thanks, Larry. I made, I made some notes because I knew I wouldn't uh, be able to get through all of this uh, without remembering some some parts of it. And then that uh, video was a good thing I didn't go right up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my friend's name is Grant Lefton. Grant and I met in September of 1983. How many of you are around in 1983? <laughs> uh, Grant, Grant uh, I, I met him in a, in a, a dorm at Cairnport. I think it was my first year of Bible school, which was his second or third. He came to my dorm room door and said, Hey, I'm your new roommate. <laughs> and uh, that really started a, uh, an interesting relationship. Grant and I got along well, we were good friends. We weren't best friends necessarily, but we were good friends. And Grant had a way of uh, challenging me on things, and I had a way of challenging him on things. And it's just something that that uh, that we that we grew through as we spent a year. Grant was my first roommate. I've kept my second second roommate. I keep one of them. <laughs>
And I, but I know we prayed for so many of my family members. Uh, we connected through snail mail, actually. He had our last uh, mailing address is what he came across. And, and, uh, then, and then through texting, he, he doesn't do a lot with, uh, with um, um, electronics and, and stuff. So uh, uh, it, was, it was good to hear from him. And, uh, and we're planning actually to get together in August. He's going to be coming through. So when he does come through, it's going to be uh, just a few weeks.